Hello everyone and welcome to um, the launch of Horrifying Tales, an anthology um, hosted by uh, us and the York Centre for Writing at York St John University in collaboration with the wonderful Green Teeth uh, Press. Uh, I'm Robert Edgar, uh, if you've got your copy of the book you will have noticed that I've uh, written the introduction to this and worked on the project uh, with Imogen, who you'll see more of uh, in a moment. So just by way of introduction uh, and a brief introduction before you hear from the people you're really here to listen to, the writers in this in the fantastic collection, I thought it'd be useful just to kind of introduce where the project uh, came from. Uh, and it comes from, uh, as all things do, good things do, really from an idle conversation I had with my colleague, John, who had just written a book, a moment of self-promotion, a book on adaptation. Uh, which is available from all good bookshops and some really terrible ones as well. Uh, and it was, we talked about kind of kids TV as, as one is wont to. Uh, and that coincided with something I was doing on uh, a third year module where I was talking about folk horror and uh, talking to students, third year students, about things that had interested me when I was a child in the late 70s and in the 80s and all sorts of weird and eerie kind of folk horror infused things. In fact, I've uh, perhaps uh, banged on to a uh, year's worth of uh, students about the Bells of Astercote, shown them Dougal and the Blue Cat and traumatised many with uh, renditions of Florence's sad song. And this research then led me to looking at the work of the people from Scarred for Life, Steve and Dave, their wonderful work. And if you haven't encountered that, I can push you towards that. It's absolutely wonderful, wonderful stuff. And it was that discovery that there's a real interest, very broad academic and popular interest uh, in this material. Uh, John and I were joined by our colleague Lauren, Lauren Stevenson, who's an expert in horror. And we developed a project on Weird and Eerie children's TV and, and literature. And that's currently still in development uh, as an academic book. And it's with Bloomsbury at the moment or in the final stages of review uh, of that book as an academic. We were searching for a title and John, partly as a joke said, horrifying children. And we said, that's the one. About the same time, uh, Green Teeth launched and produced the fabulous Pondweed, a book which talks about folklore. And again, if you haven't got a copy, you really need to, to get hold of one. Uh, and then the equally fabulous Unhomely. And it was a simple step to put the two things together. Uh, and uh, I was joined by Imogen and we came up with the idea of horrifying uh, tales. So uh, enough from me, other than to point out the thing that I write about in the introduction is sat behind me an original Dennis Fisher school machine, and there's the latest uh, effort. I did put it back into use, as I said I would, in the introduction. So I'll hand over now to Imogen to introduce uh, the book. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Um, I'm Imogen from Green Teeth Packs, and Horrifying Tales is our third anthology, which features prose and poetry inspired by the unsettling children's television Rob mentioned and the sort of creepy childhood, creepy things in our childhood that made us hide behind the sofa. Um, so it features the work of 14 new and not so new writers who really capture what it means to be haunted by cartoon characters and some of the really grotesque things that used to be children's television. Um, yeah, and the cover was beautifully designed by Dan Hunt, who really captures what we wanted to do with the sort of 70s inspired theme. And yeah, over to you, Rob. Right, so the, uh, the running order for, for this is, we'll hear some readings, I'll run through those in a moment. Uh, and if there are any questions for um, our, our writers, please feel free to pop those in the chat and I can ask them at the end. Or if you've got any questions for Imogen about Green Teeth Press, about publishing uh, generally, uh, we can ask as many of those uh, as we can as, as well. Um, so please feel free to pop them in the chat. I've got a few questions I want to ask Imogen as, uh, uh, as, as well. So without further ado, we'll hand over to our first speaker, uh, Clara. 
Hi, thank you for having me. I'm so pleased to be part of this. So um, my piece, to begin with then, is Scared for Life. It was something about the eyebrows made of wheat tips that stayed with me 30 years on. It wasn't him taking his head off. It wasn't even having a rack of different heads to choose from, but the eyebrows. They're in there, scored in my brain, as vivid as any visions of my actual youth. Along with the monkeys on wheels in The Wizard of Oz, the falling through the cracks in Nightmare, and all those things that sometimes pop into the forefront of your mind and send a shiver down your spine, which are never less than when you first saw them. Visions emblazoned deeply into your mind, never to be forgotten out of context, but still as scary as they were for the pre-teen me, who was determined to bravely watch everything my three-year-old brother did, unflinchingly, and not sleep for weeks. I also accidentally saw Terminator aged eight, and the pinhead image on the video cover in the local video store, which is as burned to my retina as all the other horrifying visions. As an adult, I don't watch horror. I avoid the genre at all costs. Largely, I think, because I was inadvertently exposed to so much of it as a child. My teenage and adult self now have enough images to haunt me forever. I knew, even by age 15, when asked if I wanted to watch Halloween, my answer was no, definitely not. I'd already had a lifetime's worth of scary images and ideas ingrained in my mind's eye, so that all I wanted to watch was Disney. Oh, hang on, no, no, Disney terrified me too. Bambi's mum being shot? My poor mum had to remove her screaming children from the cinema aged three and six. It was a U rating somehow, as was the aforementioned Wizard of Oz. The snowman melting? I must have been about four on first watching, far too young. Watership down? Commence fear of rabbits. Rent a ghost? Commence fear of ghosts. And weren't adults supposed to know better? Johnny Briggs I only watched once, as his parents, again, were so scary. Someone even got trapped in a fridge. Bring on claustrophobia and a fear of large fridges for life. Thanks. They read like a list of childhood traumas. Then there were clowns, puppet shows, masks, Halloween, least favourite day of the year. All best avoided. I could handle Sesame Street. The Fraggles and the Muppets, thankfully watched when old enough to know that they were puppets. But Legend and Labyrinth were watched far too young, play school, and they still haunt me. I even shuffle a little bit uncomfortably watching Hobbits. Another anxiety, this time of being left behind, I believe stems from the unicorn from Dungeons and Dragons, cleverly named Uni, who kept getting left behind. And instead of leaving the stupid creature, they stayed to save him every single episode. In my dreams, though, I was left behind. So I mainly stuck to cartoons, Super Ted, Danger Mouse, Count Duckula and DuckTales, and the wonderful Cities of Gold, which I think I truly believed was real, even though it was a cartoon. Until one day on the broom cupboard, Philip Schofield burst my bubble of childhood belief by saying that the kid's hair was blowing in the opposite direction to the clouds in the opening credits. It was never the same again for me, like discovering Dad was Santa. In hindsight, I also now note how few girls or women were in any of these, especially the cartoons, and if they did appear, they needed rescuing. I think my only heroines were long-distance Clara in Pigeon Street and Shitara from Thundercats, as obviously before the new millennia, only boys could have adventures. Then in the 90s, we drifted into Neighbours, Biker Grove, Grange Hill, the really wild show and Blue Peter, and all that horrifying weirdness of kids' TV fell away and we were little grown-ups. Books were somewhat easier to close and hide away, thus stopping images fully forming. And you could stop reading and car boot sell the book or return it to the local library to scare the bejesus out of another unsuspecting child. I loved Roald Dahl, except for the twits, as he managed to create enjoyable fear. The witches and giants in the BFG were terrifying, but somehow I felt in safe hands. I knew they would be redeemed. But five children in it, and the aptly named scary children's books? 
I'll stick to the tiger who came to tea, please. Lord of the Flies at 12 years old, anyone? Flowers in the attic. I avoided the Goosebumps series and even horrible histories. There are some horrible historic facts I just don't want to read and never forget, thanks. Perhaps I just have a weak disposition for stories. I can't have house plants because of Day of the Triffids, compulsory school weeding for this 14 year old. I have to duck and weave around them when they're randomly in entranceways and shops, just in case, you know. So no, I do not read, watch, enjoy horror, any form of torture, anything that involves small spaces, fire, skeletons, masks, clowns, puppets, large fridges, and I'm ridiculously squeamish. For although I tried to shield myself from all these things, unfortunately, even by my teenage years, the damage had been done. Horrific visions and ideas have been firmly imparted in my young mind. So thank you, children's TV, novel and film writers. Instead of inspiring me to undertake adventures and be brave, you made me scared of everything for life, possibly even scarred for life too. And you also failed to give me any heroines to aspire to. Don't mention The Goonies, a kid's film indeed. Terrifying, and no girls in that one either. That's great. Thank you very much, Clara. And uh, very, very well said. These things do really stay with us. Uh, as a, a brief aside, I was talking to my, my father, who turned 81 recently, about exactly this kind of material and about uh, a programme we used to watch, which many of you might be familiar with or might, might remember or might have seen recently. It's been repeated on certain channels. Uh, and I mentioned Sapphire and Steel. This is his DVD, which I've still got hold of. And he racked his brains for a moment and said, Sapphire and Steel, Sapphire and Steel. And then just said, the one with the soldier on the station. And his face fell and he had to sit down. There's real power uh, in this stuff. Moving on swiftly, our next reading, uh, I'll hand uh, straight over to uh, Liz. Hi there, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Liz. I wrote three matches at the end of the book, which I will read for you now. The blackness was absolute. It bore down like the weight of the earth, swaddling him in an indelible cocoon. For several long moments, he wasn't sure if his eyes were open or closed. Have I gone blind? The silence roared in his ears. Have I gone deaf? Reaching out in reflex, his knuckles wrapped against a solid surface with a bloom of pain, leaving skin behind. A swell of panic compressed his chest, and as he gulped in a greedy breath of stale air, his meaty stomach pressed into the same unyielding barrier. He began to search with his hands, squirming, pushing and probing. A fat bead of sweat trickled across his temple, despite the cold. Slowly, he explored the inside of his tiny tomb. He patted his flesh. Why am I naked? Hello? He called. Nothing. The blackness swallowed his voice. He hugged himself, a barrier of crossed arms against the nothing. An object. His fingers stumbled across a tiny object laid on his flabby chest and he clutched it like a lifeline. A fold of card with a slim strip that had braided his fingers, three frail sticks inside. A matchbook. Fumbling, he tore out a match and awkwardly held the book to his face. If I could see, everything would be better. He poured the match across the strip once, again, for a third time. It flared brighter than a fragment of the sun caught in a jar. Immediately, he squeezed his eyes shut in agony and wheezed frantically at the tiny flame. The spark went out. The acrid stench of its passing hung in the stagnant air. Its after image clung like a scar to the inside of his eyelids. It was a while before the temptation returned. It would be foolish, he admonished, to waste another match. Matches, he reminded himself, 
require oxygen. So do you, he hissed. But every thought returned insatiably to the second match. He lay in the darkness, cuddling the matchbook. Wouldn't it be better if I could see? Perhaps, he reasoned, it would be worth spending a little oxygen. Only this time, he conceded, be ready. Titillated, he peeled back the matchbook's flimsy covering. Pulling out the second match, he carefully screwed his eyes tight shut before he struck it. He perceived an orange blossom beyond his eyelids and, ever so gradually, cracked open his eyes. He was imprisoned in pale plywood. His vision swam through indulgent tears and stinging, pulled sweat. There was something there, a blurry message scrawled on the coarse bare surface and a pale square, a Polaroid. It was too close and his aging eyes refused to focus. He yelped as the match burned unnoticed into his fingertips and the light sputtered out. You have to see. The darkness flooded back and embraced him like an unwelcome lover, heavy, cloying and relentless. You have to know. Feverishly, he rubbed the last match against the strip over and over, feeling it go limp and crumple between his clammy fingers. His entire existence shrunk to one goal. Read the message. Understand. Shaking, he braced the bulbous tip of the match with his forefinger and swept it hard across the ignition strip. A sob of relief burst from his throat as the final match fizzled to life. Pushing with the bare soles of his feet, he crammed his head into the corner of the box and forced his face as far away from the writing as possible. His treacherous eyes burned with the effort. Rows of pinched faces stared out from the picture taped above the letters. Striped ties and uniform navy blazers. His own face beamed out from the back row, bracketed by his closest cronies and encircled in bright red ink. With the last of the light, his gaze traveled down to the letters. Painfully, slowly, they settled into shape. You won't be missed. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, I, I feel quite quite cold um, following that. Uh, it's a good job on these things you can mute the video because whilst Liz was reading, I was staring very intently uh, at the, the screen, as I'm sure you all were, and my cat brushed herself against my leg and I let out an audible uh, scream. Uh, oh God, thank you very much, Liz. Um, and moving on quickly, uh, Paul, uh, I'll hand straight over to Paul Childs with Conductor. Hi, uh, I'm Paul Childs and uh, my story is based on that one thing you couldn't escape if you grew up in the 70s and 80s, which is the government sanctioned safety films. Through thick, thick fog, we follow a lonely country railway flanked by steep overgrown banks. A dark tunnel looms out of the mist. As we approach it, we begin to make out figures through the haze. I am the conductor growls a deep disembodied voice. We recognize it, but we're not sure where from. In the distance, we hear sorrowful electronic music. As the fog dwindles, two motionless children fade into view, a boy and a girl. Their heads are bowed. A third, much taller individual lurks behind them, obscured by the gloom. Wherever there is a railway, you will find me, ready to help naughty children the trespassers and the vandals make their connection. A man with a thick moustache, wearing the uniform of an old fashioned railway guard steps out of the murk and towers over the children. He looks us in the eye, his unblinking gaze filled with fury. He places a hand on the little girl's shoulder. She looks up at us. Her skin is so pale it almost seems blue. There is no life in her black eyes. Caroline's friends said she was too cowardly to take the shortcuts across the railway. She proved them wrong, and now they won't be teasing her ever again. She bows her head again. The conductor ruffles the boy's hair. 
the emotionless child looks up at us. Keith lost his ball on the track. The boy looks to his left. We see a black and white football lying in the ballast at the tunnel's entrance, the leather shredded and limp. Its burst bladder protrudes like the tongue of a dead animal by the roadside. I helped him find it. He takes a silver watch on a chain from his jacket pocket and examines it and the 815 from Manchester. He slots the watch back into his pocket. We float towards him through tendrils of mist, getting closer, closer, until all we can see is the center of his eye. Reflected in his impossibly black pupil is a steam train thundering towards us. A whistle shrieks, a steam and smoke from the engine violently swirl, merging with the mist until everything is white. The music swells as the fog clears. We see a gray platform crowded with pale, expressionless children. The carriage doors creak open. All aboard, calls the conductor. The children shuffle onto the carriages. When the platform is empty, the doors slam shut as one. The train pulls away and the shriek of the whistle fades to silence as the carriages are swallowed one by one by the tunnel's gaping mouth. We back away from the conductor until we see him glaring down his nose, pointing threateningly at us. Stay off the tracks, he says, or it's the end of the line for you. He freezes, holding us in his malevolent stare. And the words railways are not playgrounds appear in front of him. After a few seconds, everything fades to black. And the screen erupts in colour and sound and a jolly tune accompanies a gigantic bumblebee handing bowls of breakfast cereal to a pair of children who lick their lips excitedly. Charlie, guess what? Jimmy nudged his sister in the ribs. What? She said. He's real, you know. What? Swarmy, off the nectar nibbles advert. Nah, it's just a man in a suit, she said. I might only be seven, but I'm not stupid. Not swarmy, you idiot, he said. I meant the conductor, he's real, Charlie laughed. Don't be silly, he's not real. He is, Jimmy said. I heard Rob's sister say her boyfriend saw him down by Graveling Tunnel last week. No, he didn't. Shut up, Charlie pouted. Jimmy smirked when he recognized the face she always pulled when she was about to cry. As she began sniffing back tears, Jimmy leaned in close to her ear. He waits by the track and lures little brats like you down there. And when you're close enough, he grabs you and he pulls you into the tunnel, which is like the gate to hell or something. And then he drives his train over you forever. Mom, Charlie wailed. Jimmy's scaring me again. No, I'm not, Mum. Charlie's being a baby. Enough, you two, came a shout from the other room. Charlotte, I've told you before, monsters are not real. James, stop frightening your little sister. I'm busy. I haven't got the patience for your nonsense right now. Take her out to play somewhere, will you? Oh, Mum, that's not fair. James Andrew Taylor. If you want to see that lost ark thing with your friends tomorrow, then you will do this for me now. But no buts. And don't come back until tea time. Fine. He stomped into the garden with Charlie trail, but tra trailing behind him. They retrieved their BMXs from the shed and mounted them, pedals raised, ready to set off. Where are we going? Charlie sniffed, wiping tears and snot away with the back of her hand. Dunno. He pushed off and slowly cycled towards the main road. He grinned and looked over his shoulder. I know what we can do, he said. What? You'll see. Just don't be a slow coach or I'll ditch you. Charlie pedalled furiously to catch up. This'll be great, Jimmy chuckled to himself. The kids were never late for dinner. A knot of fear twisted in Mrs. Taylor's stomach as she searched the phone book for the numbers of the other parents from school. She turned the TV volume down before making the first call and didn't hear the sorrowful electronic music of an old 1970s safety film. I am the conductor, growls a deep disembodied voice. Wherever there is a railway, you'll find me, ready to help naughty children, the trespassers and the vandals make their connection. Two pale children step out of the mist and look, at, look up at us with cold, dead eyes. Jimmy's mother told him to look after Charlie, but I took care of them both instead.
Thanks very much, Paul. <laughs> Absolutely chilling uh, and uh, spot on about those public information films. Um, again, burnt into the memory of, of many people. Electric pylons, I'll never fly a kite near a pylon. <clears throat> I'll always have a damp tea towel in the kitchen in case there's a chip pan fire. And I, I do remember, I mean, it really brought it back to me, that one, on a personal note. I, I remember probably mid eighties going on a cycle ride with my friend Steve, who had a Diamondback, I had a Talker BMX, and getting close to the canal uh, in, in Doncaster and uh, stopping dead. We were terrified of the spirit of dark and lonely water. Uh, we're moving on and we've got now Errol um, uh, on, on video, uh, a ghost in the machine. So we'll hand over virtually to Errol. Remember the Bear by Errol Graham Hartsley. Do you remember the bear in the big blue house? How he used to push his giant wet nose against the screen, taking in your intoxicating scent before pulling back, resisting the temptation of the hunt, stopping himself for just a moment before he pushes through the glass barricade, his jaws opening wide, releasing the heavy scent of rotting flesh. Splinters of small, child-sized bones sticking out between his fangs. Strings of ragged flesh in chunks stuck to his gums. Pink tinged saliva dripping from his tongue, falling from his mouth, soaking into the living room carpet. His predatory gaze trained on you. Pupils dilated at the thought of the feast of innocent young flesh he's about to devour. Reducing you to nothing but a pool of blood, slowly soaking into the carpeted floor for your mother to discover as soon as she's finished making lunch. You know, even if you screamed she wouldn't get to you in time, he'd be back on screen and you'd be gone. So you sit there, paralysed, eyes squeezed tight, breath held even tighter, waiting for the end. Moments pass, you hear the bear snuffling. You can almost feel his hot breath blowing over you, then nothing. The bear has pulled away now, telling you that you smell of grass as he moves on deeper into the house. You breathe a sigh of relief, realising you've survived another close encounter with the bear. There's always tomorrow though, you think. One day, your luck just may run out. Hope you enjoyed. Thank you. That's great. Thanks virtually uh, to, to Errol, uh, fa a fabulous uh, piece of work. And thanks to uh, all our four readers uh, today. Well, we've got a little, uh, little time now. Um, and uh, I was uh, wrong earlier. Uh, so uh, yes, it, it, rather than the chat, it's the Q&A function that we're using uh, now. So to, yeah, to hand over to you, I think if, uh, if we start with questions for, for our readers, perhaps, then we'll move on to questions for, for Imogen um, in a moment. There's a couple of questions uh, popping in, but please feel free to pop any, any more in and I'll, I'll ask those. Uh, I think as videos uh, from our contributors go go on. Um, yeah, question to start with from, from Jez. Um, question which is focused uh, initially about Bagpuss um, and just says writing about small films, but I guess we could we could think about this from uh, in terms of anything from from our our, our childhood, anything we watch uh, watched as as children. Uh, about and the, the question really is about the scare factor of programs like Bad Puss, um, which have this kind of cosy quality, but are also deeply eerie. And these two, it's something that fascinates me as well. Something which it, it, the, these programs kind of inhabit both of those spaces. I mean, what what do we think about that being kind of really cosy and really terrified at the same time. Is that something that you think applies to the things that inspired you to write your pieces? Um, well, with the conductor, uh, obviously it's films that were supposed to be there to keep us safe. And I guess, I mean, especially with Dark and Lonely Water, which was a major influence on the conductor, 
they were deliberately designed to scare us into behaving. So, I mean, with, with um, public information films, yeah, they're definitely designed to frighten us. Um, but there was an article about Bagpuss in 14 Times by Bob Fisher a few years ago. And I can't remember his exact reasoning, but he, he talks about how the, the 70s was a darker time. And, you know, it wasn't deliberately frightening or wasn't supposed to be deliberately frightening, but it's just, it captured the, the mood of the time. Yeah, it's absolutely right. Although with, with Dark and Lonely Water, I mean, I, when I, I started using it um, in, in a teaching session, a teaching environment, um, uh, and also I have to admit for my own amusement and, and nostalgia reasons as well, I was astounded when it suddenly came, it was Donald Pleasance doing the voice, you know, this kind of icon of many horror films. And I was thinking of all the things I've seen, I'd seen since. So you're right, there was a kind of inherent darkness about about that material. It kind of bled through into, into the early early 80s and into, as Clara was saying, into, into things like Goonies. Uh, how about everyone else? I mean, did, did you find the same with the things that inspired you as uh, for, for your writing? I think you've, you've heard from me already, but I found everything scary. So <laughs> I'm probably the worst person. But I think from listening to Paul Charles as well, again, it just sends shivers. I remember at school, we had to watch a film they wheeled in the giant television and they just all sit around and it took ages to get it going. And it was a video and it was about, again, railways and our house backed on to a railway line. I was already terrified. And in it, this kid gets his feet chopped off by the train. <laughs> but it was just no holds barred. Basically, don't go near them or this will happen. And so I get nervous if I go near any antennas now. <laughs> that film. Sorry, that film is called Robbie, and it was presented by Peter Purvis from Blue Peter, and then they re-filmed the introduction with Keith Chegwin instead. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's very they're, they're kind of incredibly blunt as as kind of short narratives. I showed the uh, the the one the name of which escapes me. I should know this uh, uh, with the the kite and the, and the pile on to, to my daughter a couple of years ago. The time was maybe maybe eleven, and. Um, it stopped and she was waiting for the next stage <laughs> and for the kid to get up and to move on. And I said, oh, that, that's it. That's, that's the end. That's what we had to, to deal with. So I suppose they were, they were tremendously uh, effective. But again, the idea of a kind of cosiness, a, a warmth. I mean, something like Bagpuss, I think is particularly interesting. It kind of takes us into a, a sepia sort of Edwardian world. Um, and as <laughs> Holly's posted in the uh, Q&A section, yeah, you know why you're scared of so much and why you avoid horror at all costs. And I think it has that effect on people. Either it takes us to horror because it's so familiar and comforting in a way and, and it pushes others away. Um, but yeah, is there a kind of a, a, a retreat into some kind of cosy Edwardian or other world? And I suppose the other point of that, and Andrew's asked a question as well, which I think is, re is really interesting. Are we kind of now going back to a sort of 1970s, we're looking at the 70s and early 80s, through rose tinted, or I suppose grey tinted, wouldn't it be with horror um, <laughs> spectacles? Is it a kind of retreat into a different world, do we think, that's kind of cosy at the same time? Um, I think that um, it, particularly shows which are not designed to be scary, like the, um, the, the warning programs. Uh, they, they tend to get creepier as you get older. So you watch it quite innocently as a child and all you see is the cosy and you, you think it's wonderful. And then meanwhile, your parents are sat behind you on the sofa going, what is this? Mm -hmm. And I, I, it's easy to look back at childhood shows and go, that was actually very creepy. And to look at more current children's television and go, not nowhere near as creepy, but actually I think maybe in 20 years we'll be looking back and, and seeing current children's television is just as creepy. Um, I was talking to some friends of mine who are also um, writers just the other day and we were all commenting about how creepy we found the tweenies and the Teletubbies. So <laughs> I, I, I think that a lot of children's television is inherently very creepy and I'm, I'm not quite sure why, but I feel like the creepiness grows as we get older and look back on the things that we found very amusing as children. Yeah, something desperately unsettling, and and is that that is that part of it? Do we think? Uh, and again, please feel free to pop questions in the um, 
in the Q and A as we as we go along. But are these things more unsettling than they are scary? Kind of openly scary, jump scary. Are they things which kind of eat away at us? Is that part of the part of the difficulty? Uh, part of the the kind of attraction, sorry, of them. Part of what makes them difficult for us later on. That they, yeah, unsettling is unsettling worse than being openly scary. Is it worse than the jump scare that we see from different kinds of of horror? I'd say definitely. I think as an adult, I do watch. I've watched things like um, Final Destination. Is it Final Destination where there's and they yeah and they all die and scream. I quite I've quite enjoyed jumpy things. Because you know it's a little bit silly, but yeah, things that are, are dark, <laughs> that like you say, they stay with you, um, and you never quite get rid of. That's the worst. That's what I really try and avoid, um, and especially squeamish things. I feel like these days everything is shown. Again, I don't know whether that's better or worse. You used to watch a horror film and you just see the chainsaw and a spatter of blood, and like you know, you'd see the knife and you'd see a bit of blood, but now they actually show everything and I don't know whether that makes it better or worse I don't know what the others think yeah I mean I think the, the idea that something is is present but it maybe has a, a diminishing effect in that it's immediate so yeah I think the idea that the things that we're all inspired by with this book you know e e eating away at you is is, is it has that effect as Jess you know, says you're quite right I think the unsettling stays with you and jump scares are quickly forgotten once your your heart rate's gone down from that that uh, immediate effect yeah it disappears it goes but these other things kind of Kind of stay stay with us there's also i suppose knowing that they become kind of trace memories they sit there in the back of our head and suddenly are reignited which is kind of what we're doing this evening we're making people frightened once again by dragging out their memories uh, from the back of back of our heads um time's moving on i will keep an eye on the q a oh sorry there are a couple of questions there i do Apologize. Oh, a couple of comments. Yeah, Nikki, yeah, sudden horror, far more unsettling. Yeah, you're quite right. Uh, suggestion uh, is, is far more horrible because, yeah, our imagination does does the work. It is. It's the thing, isn't it? Those kind of lingering under the bed, ready to jump out. And, and David <laughs> asks, the Charlie Says public uh, info animated films, uh, which made their way into, interestingly, into, uh, uh, into a prodigy track in the 90s. Uh, kind of there's a parallel there with with perhaps 70s uh, music and the birth of uh, folk horror. Um, thanks to everyone. We'll move on just quickly because I know people have got questions and I certainly have questions uh, for uh, Imogen um, as publisher of this. Uh, and I know people wanted to ask questions specifically about publishing no one more than more than me. So please do uh, pop things in. Uh, in the in the, the Q and A section as we go along, so if we just turn over to Imogen for a moment, I wonder if you just give us because this is these books, these lovely books are produced by by Green Teeth. I wonder if you could just give us a quick insight into how Green Teeth came about and and particularly perhaps why you started with Pondweed and why Green Teeth, why the name Green Teeth. It's, um, yeah, so I started out in publishing um, in 2018 when I founded Green Teeth Press and that was kind of inspired by work I did on the creative writing degree at York St John um, and we did a publishing module and we met loads of different people and one of them was Jamie McGarry from Valley Press and he was so inspiring in that he was very good at making making books sound appealing because up until that point I was absolutely set on being a writer um, and then I quickly realised there's not a lot of money in writing and that I'm probably better off with a sensible publishing background than being a starving artist for the rest of my life so uh, that's how I was inspired and then I saved up some money and just started publishing books because it just felt like a thing that I could do. Um, I don't think I ever intended on doing Green Teeth Press full time until this time last year um, when everything just started expanding and 
people started buying books and it seemed realistic for me to do this as a job. Um, and Green Teeth Press came about when I was really into folklore at the time and I, I was interested in the way women are perceived in folklore uh, and thus Jenny Green Teeth is a story about a river hag named Jenny Greentee who pulls in children into bogs um, and that's where that came from and with Pondweed this one came about because it just felt natural to do a folklore inspired book as our first book um, and yeah it was just easy segue into books <laughs> that's great and why green teeth where did the name come from just talk, talk us through that in a bit more detail because it's a it's a distinctive name um and it certainly has kind of folklorish connections but yeah where, where did it come from what was the inspiration for that for that so i was just scrolling through wikipedia <laughs> um <laughs> looking for like northern folklore about women and I just saw Jenny Greenteeth and thought, that's it, that's it, that's what I want to call my publishing house. That make, and it works really well. And the, the logo, how did the logo come about? Because there's a, <laughs> a yeah, it, it chills me in itself. <laughs> yeah, so our first logo was just done sort of as a placeholder. I don't think it was ever anything that I wanted to keep forever but last year we had a little bit of a rebrand when everything started getting a little bit more professional and we had um, Julia King who is a very good illustrator um, do a few designs of teeth because I think teeth the teeth the tooth is was already established as a part of our brand so, yeah, that's how that came about. Yeah, I and mean, there is something of, of, of nightmares in teeth and teeth breaking. And, uh, oh, yeah. So, uh, sorry, I'm, yeah, sweaty palms, but in a, in a good way. So what's next? And Scotty asked that question as well, preempts one I was going to ask. You've done an awful lot, I think, in a, a very short uh, period of time. Horrifying Tales is book number five, isn't it? An anthology number three three yeah so um so that that's a lot in a yeah tremendously short space of time so what's what's next for green teeth have you any uh, anything you you want to kind of share at the moment about next plans yeah so we have another anthology coming out um in april may time and that's a sci-fi inspired anthology called tales to survive the stars and that's so exciting because that's got like comics in it like sort of short one page comics and that really explores sort of short fiction in visuals which is really interesting it was really fun to have a look at all the submissions for that um and then we have another anthology coming out in october september and there will be more details on submissions at the end of this month coming out opening submissions next month yeah and and can you tell us what that is yet or is that still details haven't been finalized yet okay that's all right i think i know what that is but we'll we'll hold off right that's a real teaser so everyone do check out the uh, the green teeth website follow them on twitter and uh, and you sign up for the newsletter as well so you get information about that because i know what it is and it's very it's um it's all uh, tremendously um exciting that's good and there's a few a few questions coming in the q a about how to get hold of copies of um pondweed and horrifying tales and other green teeth publications how, how should people best how can people best do that yeah so they're all on our website pondweed isn't because we're doing a second edition in uh, August time around the summer so that's really exciting there's going to be more pieces in it and some hopefully some illustrations to go in it as well so that's going to be really exciting um, but yeah all on our website 
That's fantastic. Thanks very much. If there are any, oh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> more questions coming in about about the next anthology uh, topic. So obviously a huge amount of interest uh, in that. Uh, we are close to um, our hour together. Um, so uh, I think if, unless there's any more uh, questions that you want to pop in the Q&A, uh, there's a lot of uh, really, very, uh, really interesting, very positive comments about all the readings today and about the, the power of children's TV and fiction and how it, how it stays with us. So as is um, the way with events uh, such as this, I mean, the thanks uh, have to go at the end and thanks Firstly, of course, to Imogen and to Green Teeth Press for being part of the event and for publishing and giving people the opportunity to be published in horrifying tales. Green Teeth Press, I think, is uh, it, Imogen was uh, a while ago a student at York St John, so we're we're all tremendously proud of her work. Uh, but we got this is, a, is a Green Teeth are a fantastic uh, publisher and they're doing uh, amazing things. So do follow and support them. Uh, thanks to all the people who've read this evening and indeed all the contributors to this book. Uh, those people who haven't read this evening as well as those who, who had. It's, uh, it's remarkable uh, work. Uh, really special thanks to the York St John uh, University events team, uh, particularly to Leanne Roberts uh, and Hannah Bernstein who've really helped out with, with this event. Uh, we do have more events coming up in the York Centre for Writing at York St. John University, so uh, do follow that. We'll be announcing some more events uh, relatively soon. Uh, and uh, I suppose finally, just to say, we, we, do, we, will, we were due to have, just as uh, the pandemic hit, a uh, conference with Dave and Steve and Bob Fisher uh, doing their Scarred for Life work and to talk about this kind of work, and we're hoping to resurrect that relatively soon as soon as we can do so keep an eye on that as well and we'll do more horrifying tales and horrifying children work in the future uh, we are also editing uh, a new collection on folk horror as well so keep an eye out uh, for that thank you everyone for coming along and uh, a virtual and a real round of applause to all those who've uh, been, been involved there's normally a virtual button for this thank you everyone uh, Good evening, good night, and don't have nightmares. <laughs>